Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar, The Recovery of Ontario's Butterfly at Species at Risk. I'm Dan Marino with Long Point Basin Land Trust, and I'll be doing a quick introduction and moderating the question period. Uh, but before we get going, and while people are still signing in, uh, a couple of housekeeping items. We ask that you please keep your video off. Um, we've also muted everyone's microphone, so please use the chat box to ask questions throughout, and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Uh, and we will be recording the webinar, so if you have any connection issues, you can also watch again later. Uh, so this is the fifth webinar and ninth Explore the Outdoors event for 2022. If you haven't already, I encourage everyone to check out the events page of our website to see all of the other events we have lined up this year. Uh, and please spread the word. Um, and if you haven't heard of us before, Long Point Basin Land Trust is a charitable, non-government organization with the mission to protect and restore functioning ecosystems in the Long Point Basin which is a geographical area located in the Central Carolinian region. Uh, this is achieved through land securement, habitat restoration, research, and outreach. Uh, so to learn more about us and stay connected, uh, we encourage everyone to visit our website and sign up to our e-newsletter and join us on social media. So uh, Long Point Basin Land Trust currently owns and stewards 341 hectares of land, over 13 nature reserves. Um, all of them are located within Norfolk County, Ontario. Uh, seven of the nature reserves are open to the public and have, or we are in the process of developing a formal trail system. Uh, this allows us to provide opportunities for people to connect with the environment through hands-on and outdoor experiences. Um, and uh, our Explore the Outdoors events, we have two upcoming events. Um, there's a virtual presentation on Lake Erie's disappearing shoreline. Uh, that I believe is next week or August 23rd. Um, and we have our annual Monarch Tagging event. Uh, so for more information or to register for either or both of those events, please do visit our website. Um, and just quickly, I'm going to introduce our speaker tonight before she gets started. Uh, so tonight we have Jessica Linton doing a presentation. Uh, Jessica is a, bi a biological consultant who works on a variety of inventory, monitoring, research and recovery projects focused on species at risk. A large portion of her work over the last 10 years has focused on rare butterflies associated with tall grass habitats. Uh, she is the founder and chair of the Ontario Butterfly Species at Risk Recovery Team and the author of the Kosiwik Status uh, Report and Provincial Recovery Strategy for the Modeled Dusky Wing and the National Recovery Strategies for Frosted Elfin, Eastern Perseus Dusky Wing and Carner Blue. Uh, Jessica is also a member of the Kosiwik Arthropod Specialist Subcommittee and the Long Point Walsingham Forest Open Country and Fire Suppression Working Group. Uh, so without further ado, I'll pass it over to Jessica to um, chat with us tonight about uh, butterflies. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to start at the end of my presentation here. Okay, are we good there? Everyone can see that? Get a nod from, that. okay, great. Okay, so um, thanks for having me. Um, as Dan mentioned, I'm here to talk to you guys tonight about the protection recovery of Ontario's butterfly species at risk um, with a focus on model dusky wing, just because that's taken up a large proportion of my time um, the last 10 years or so. But I will be touching on all of Ontario's butterfly species at risk, at least briefly, and how the model dusky wing is kind of paving the way for us to work towards recovery of all of our species at risk. So what are species at risk? This is a term that gets thrown around a lot. Um, we often associate it with kind of charismatic megafauna, things like polar bears and caribou, uh, we know are species at risk. Um, but there are lots of mini fauna or small kind of um, uh, other types of insects and invertebrates that we don't think about as being species at risk or care to give them too much thought. And these are the ones that um, I've been focused on sort of the last few years and that I focus on quite a bit as um, a member of the arthropod subcommittee of Kasiwik, which for those of you who don't recognize that acronym, it's the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. So we're responsible for deciding what little insect or arthropod species should be considered for assessment and ultimately putting forward recommendations on what their status should be to the Minister of the Environment. Um, so in Canada and in Ontario, we have kind of a cyclical assessment process. And this is important in, in the context of the presentation that I'm going to give today because you'll recognize several stages of 
of this process in the work that I do and, and what I talk about. So as I mentioned, first, there's like an assessment process. So um, that usually involves soliciting a report and somebody goes out and they look at um, all the, the sites that a species is known from, all the threats that exist at that, um, those sites, what the population status is, and a, a recommendation is put forward in terms of whether a species should be considered endangered, threatened, special concern, or not at risk. Um, and essentially endangered means that a species that is, is at imminent risk of extirpation, so no longer occurring in a geographic area. Um, in the context of federal assessments, is extirpated would be meaning uh, it's no longer going to live in Canada anymore. Threatened is that um, a species is at, at imminent risk of becoming endangered unless something is done, not done to reverse, reverse the threats that it faces. Similarly, special concern is kind of the lowest amount of protection. Uh, generally, there's no legislation that protects species of conservation concern. They're just species that we keep an eye on. Um, and then, of course, not at risk is that something that's not uh, necessarily at risk of becoming um, uh, at risk in the near future. And often, unfortunately, insects come out as another category we call data deficient, which means that we just don't know enough about these little critters in order to make an accurate assessment of um, what their, their level of risk is. So after a species goes through that assessment process, if it's listed as endangered or threatened, it then receives protection. So on a federal level, um, that would be protection under the Species at Risk Act, and that only applies to species on federal or crown lands. In Ontario, we have a Provincial Endangered Species Act. So any species that listed as endangered, threatened, or extirpated uh, in Ontario automatically receives, receives legal protection under the Endangered Species Act, and its habitat also receives protection. Once a species is listed under the Act, automatically the government is required to um, provide a government response statement in, in response to that listing and develop a recovery strategy. And a recovery strategy is essentially just a planning document that outlines the steps that are going to be go, gone through in order to reverse what's happening to that species to make it at risk. Once the recovery plan is done, we move into the implementation phase of actually implementing those recommendations. And then of course there's follow-up monitoring and evaluation. And then eventually we reach the assessment stage again. And typically species are reassessed on a 10 year time frame. So the idea being that by the time you get to the 10 years after the initial assessment, some progress has been made towards um, recovering that species uh, in order to change its status. So what butterflies are species at risk in Ontario? We have a lot of really beautiful butterflies in Ontario. Um, a lot of them are very small and people might not even notice them. So um, I'm going to just walk you through very briefly what our species at risk are. Before I do that, though, two species at risk to watch um, that I wanted, this is the, the first time I've actually included these species in my presentation, are the Northern Oak Hare Streak, which is on the right hand side there, and the Duke Skipper. These are species that were recently assessed at the federal level. Um, the Duke Skip Skipper came out as special concern and the Northern Oak Hare Street came out as threatened. So currently there's a recommendation to the Minister of the Environment at the federal level that these species be listed under the Species at Risk Act. And generally that initiates a provincial process as well. So I expect that these species will be listed under the Endangered Species Act in the coming um, uh, months or year. The species that we currently have listed um, include the Carner Blue, which is kind of our most famous example of an at-risk butterfly. Most people are familiar with it. Um, it's been extirpated since the late 1980s and was last seen in and around um, the, the Carner Blue Sanctuary in Port Franks and Pinery Provincial Park. The Frosted Elfin Butterfly um, is also unfortunately extirpated and it actually, it, it was known to occur at the St. Williams Forestry Reserve in Norfolk County. Um, that is the only documented location that we have on record for that species, although it's likely that it occurred in similar um, kind of oak savanna habitats throughout Southern Ontario. We just didn't know it until it was too late. So it's also been extirpated since the 80s. Um, oh, did I miss? I'm missing number three, which is the Eastern Perseus Duskewing. There, sorry, my slides are out of order. 
Um, Eastern Perseus dusky wing is also provincially extirpated. Uh, this species occurred over near Pinery as well, as well as the St. Williams Forestry Reserve. Um, and it hasn't been seen as well since the late 1980s. And then of course we have the monarch butterfly, definitely the most famous and charismatic of all the butterfly species at risk that we have. Currently it has a federal and provincial status of special concern. Although as most people have heard recently in the news, um, it does have an IUCN red listing of endangered and my committee that I sit on in Kasiwik recommended to the minister several years ago that it be uplisted to endangered, but that um, recommendation hasn't been put into place yet in terms of changes to the Species at Risk Act. So um, this slide here just shows the distribution of the lupin feeding butterflies. And um, I think it's important to note that a lot of these locations overlap. You can see down in Norfolk area near the St. Williams, that all three of the butterflies, Frosted Elfin, Carner Blue, and Eastern Perseus Duskewing that have been extirpated from Ontario all occurred in those areas. Um, Carner Blue is the triangle, Eastern Perseus Duskewing is the um, red circles, and Frosted Elfin is the green squares. You can also see that Carner Blue occurred in High Park near Toronto, um, down near London area, around Pinery and Sarnia. So it had a fairly, um, much larger distribution than the other two species. All of three of these species depend on wild lupin, uh, which is associated with oak savanna habitats. And these are where we find the remnant oak savanna habitats now in Southern Ontario, or a lot of them. So um, several years ago, I developed the federal recovery strategy for these lupin feeding butterflies. We did a joint strategy for them because they all rely on the same larval food plant or caterpillar host plant and they all occur in the same remnant oak savanna habitats. So there is a document that is in place at the recovery stage to identify what needs to happen in order to recover these species. Obviously it's a tall order given that they don't occur in Canada anymore. There's a lot of considerations in terms of habitat availability, source populations, the logistics of moving butterflies um, from source populations in the United States into Canada. So all of that's documented in this, in this document. Um, the fifth butterfly species at risk we have in Canada is the West Virginia white. It also has a provincial status similar to the monarch of special concern. Um, it was a species that actually was previously listed, I believe is threatened, um, and then it was downlisted when additional populations were found. Um, it feeds on um, tooth warts and it's found in deciduous uh, systems, unlike these other butterflies that I've been talking about that are more open country species. And then lastly, the model dusky wing. So model dusky wing is currently our only butterfly species at risk in Ontario that has a status of endangered. Um, and I'm going to spend a lot of my presentation from here on out talking about the model dusky wing and what we've been doing to recover this species. So the model dusky wing depends on a host plant or a larval food plant called uh, New Jersey tea or um, another one in the same genus, narrow leaf New Jersey tea or prairie redroot. So New Jersey tea is pictured on the right hand side there. Um, it's generally associated with sandy or alvar soils. And um, this is the only food plants that the larva or caterpillars of this species can eat. So females lay the eggs on this species, the caterpillars eat this species, and butterflies even nectar on it with some flowers. So they have a really close association with this, this, with this food plant. Um, this is what the life cycle of, of the model dusky wing looks like. So in early spring, um, it's a really early flyer compared to a lot of other butterflies. Adults usually emerge in late May. The butterflies will emerge and lay eggs on the host plant. And then those eggs go on to hatch into larvae or caterpillars that feed uh, on the plant and build little leaf nests using silk. You can see it's pictured there and they hide in the leaf net, nest usually during the day and feed at night um, until they um, decide to get ready for the winter. And so in most of the species range where they exist right now, they feed only till about mid-July and then they actually enter a state of diapause or inactivity. And that's where they stay until that leaf drops to the ground um, and they overwinter as a mature larva just in the leaf litter. 
in the very early spring again, they'll pupate and then emerge as adults. So that's the, the case in most of Ontario. They just have one generation of butterflies that fly a year, the early flyers, and they spend the majority of um, their life in their other juvenile life stages that are quite vulnerable to all kinds of things, weather, drought, predators um, during that time period. In, in extreme southwestern Ontario, um, they are known to have two generations a year. So they'll actually produce a second generation of butterflies before they go into diapause for the winter. So this is um, the historical and current range of where model dusky wing occurs. The blue triangles and green triangles are all historical locations. And you can see the date timelines associated with that in the legend. Um, and the yellow circles are where we know there are currently extant populations. So you can see there's been a large range contraction in their distribution um, you know, over the last 20 to 30 years. You can see that a lot of the locations where they used to historically occur overlap with that other map that I showed you of where our extirpated butterfly species occurred, including in the Norfolk area, um, in the Pinery Port Franks area, in High Park in Toronto. Um, these are locations that we don't find model dusky wing or any of those specialist lupin feeders anymore. Um, the most recent extirpations have been up near Ottawa. Um, populations of model dusky wing were present there until as recently as 2007, pretty reliably seen by people, and now they've blinked out. Um, there's also been some populations lost in the Halton Burlington area due to development. So the recovery strategy for model dusky wing is a provincial document. Um, it was completed in 2015, and as I mentioned when I was talking about the process of recovery, it's essentially a planning document that outlines steps that need to be followed in order to recover populations of this species and bring it back from its endangered status to something more manageable, where there's um, more of a chance that the species will persist in Ontario. Um, oh dear, I don't know why these are, my slides are mixed up, sorry about that. Um, so in terms of that distribution of model dusky wing and, and where I showed you that um, they occur, a lot of those occur in either historical or remnant patches of what we call oak savanna tall grass communities. Um, as I mentioned before, those lupin feeding specialist butterflies were all associated with oak savanna and model dusky wing in many locations was as well. Although it will occur also in alvar habitats, where, which are also, also sorry, a globally endangered um, type ecosystem type. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with oak savanna, they're communities that have about 25 to 30% tree canopy closure. Um, so if you picture a beautiful tall grass prairie or meadow, and then picture the odd tree, that's kind of the picture that I'm trying to paint for you. In southwestern Ontario, primarily um, the trees associated with savannas are black oak, and then they have indicator species um, of savanna in the understory, which include things like big blue stem grass, wild bergamot, woodland sunflower, smooth leaf aster, and wild lupin. Um, the way that these systems are maintained are by traditionally by fire or some sort of disturbance, which essentially allows the canopy to remain open. With the, with the absence of a disturbance of some sort, the canopy eventually will just close in and be um, overtaken by woody vegetation. So fire suppression is considered a high threat to these communities. This is a, a just a visual um, representation of what an oak savanna system looks like, even sometimes with fewer trees than what you see here. So in Ontario, um, oak savanna once covered um, probably more than 2,000 square kilometers um, of habitat in southern Ontario. And traditionally in North America, like over 11 million hectares of habitat. So these are areas that were extensive in their distribution, um, but now are isolated to remnant tiny patches. Uh, most of the land has been converted to agriculture and housing developments um, after the onset of European settlement, and we lost a lot of these habitats. Um, the main threats to tall grass habitats and, of course, the butterflies that occupy them are, notwithstanding the initial habitat loss that occurred, now we're 
we're dealing with um, extreme habitat fragmentation. So we have these isolated little pockets that are geographically separated. Um, and that's really fragmented the, the ecosystems from, into these little patches. And then within those patches, we have compounding threats that are adding to them, such as improper management. So things like fire suppression, um, not managing deer probably or properly, and white-tailed deer uh, can have devastating impacts on undiscovered vegetation if they're left unchecked. In terms of the butterflies that I've been talking about, white-tailed deer also love to eat wild lupin and New Jersey tea, host plants for these rare butterflies. Um, invasive species and not having them properly managed. Climate change, of course, is leading to extreme weather events, extreme weather conditions, drought, uh, changes in plant community composition, all of those things are having an impact on these oak savanna remnants. And then pesticide use as well. All of you are probably familiar with um, the spongy moth. We had, we've had a few outbreak years the last few years. Um, it's a species of moth that the larva have a, an outbreak cycle and they feed extensively, preferably on oak species. So they often occur in these remnant oak savanna habitats. The caterpillars themselves can threaten um, some of these butterflies through direct competition. They can also indirectly threaten them if um, land managers decide to spray pesticide in order to control these caterpillars, which will often also kill the caterpillars of rare butterflies. So what is being done to protect and recover butterfly species risk? And these are the things that I really like to focus on when I give presentations. It's kind of like all the bad news up front, like we've lost all these butterflies, we've lost the habitat, but here's the good news story about what we're doing in order to protect and recover the butterflies. Um, I'm part of the Ontario Butterfly Species at Risk Recovery Team, and this is the group that's been spearheading the efforts I'm gonna talk to you about today. So this is a, a photo of our recovery team um, that was taken in 2019 um, before the pandemic started when we could meet in person at the Toronto Zoo. Um, some of the members are the same. We have some new members and some of the members um, are no longer with us, but um, all of the partners are the same. And I won't go through all of them, but I'll just show you that there is a wide variety of partners on our recovery team and they consist of academia, nonprofit conservation organizations, um, the Cambridge Butterfly Conservatory, I'll mention because they're a huge player in the work that we're doing, um, as well as uh, federal and provincial members of government. So the overall goal of the recovery team is to promote the, the conservation and recovery of Ontario's butterfly species at risk and our habitats. And we made this broad overreaching kind of goal because we wanted to have flexibility in terms of what we do moving forward. But we also have a number of short-term goals um, that are mainly focused on um, supporting activities that protect extant populations of model dusky wing. Because as you might recall, a lot of our other butterfly species at risk have actually been extirpated, so they don't occur here anymore. So we've really put a large emphasis on protecting and preserving what we have left with model dusky wing. And related to that, we're supporting activities which result in the establishment of model duskewing at formerly occupied sites, supporting research that fills in knowledge gaps um, in the guiding recovery documents, not only for model duskewing, but the other but butterfly species at risk I mentioned. And um, another big emphasis is supporting habitat creation and enhancement for butterfly species at risk and overall just oak savanna habitat in Ontario. We provide support to land managers in this regard. And then um, we also do a lot of public outreach and stewardship activities just to kind of get the word out there. So um, the way that we've been functioning over the last three years um, is a subset of individuals that are on our recovery team um, applied for and received an NSERC Alliance grant. So this grant is um, an industrial and academic partnership grant. The main partners on the grant are the University of Guelph Norris Lab. So Dr. Ryan Norris is the principal investigator. And then the Nature Conservancy of Canada is actually the main um, uh, non-academic partner. And then in addition to that, we have several other uh, partners that all play key roles in the grant and in the recovery activities that we've been doing. So they include Wildlife Preservation Canada, 
Ontario Parks, the Cambridge Butterfly Conservatory, Alderville Black Oak Savannah, Western University, and the company I work for, which is Natural Resource Solutions. So in terms of outcomes, um, this grant has allowed us to take some of the work that we were doing individually through organizations or individual grants and really take it to the next level. So through this grant, we funded a PhD student. By the time it's done, it's a five-year grant, we'll have funded five master's students. And um, this slide actually shows that we could hire up to 12 summer students, but I believe this year we actually hired 16. So we have been able to um, hire and support a small army of young, very keen conservation biologists in not only continuing their education, but implementing recovery actions on the ground. So you might recall this slide that I showed earlier of the distribution of model duskewing. So what we're trying to do through this grant is um, recover some of the populations that have been lost. And that has started with Pinery Provincial Park. Next on our radar is actually St. Williams Conservation Reserve and surrounding NCC properties in Norfolk County. And then we're also looking to potentially augment existing populations throughout the range that um, we seem to be below a minimum threshold for survival. We see very few individuals in those populations. So we basically want to fill the map with more yellow dots. So in that regard, I'm just going to talk about some of the current projects that we're working on. Um, it's a lot of information, so I'm just going to kind of touch briefly on each of the projects. Um, at the end of the presentation, I have our recovery team website. So if you're interested in any particular project, you could go and find out more information on each of these projects. So one thing that I mentioned that we're really keen on is habitat restoration. And for this, we have a number of recovery team partners working on it. Uh, Nature Conservancy, Ontario Parks, Alderville, Black Oak, Savannah, and Conservation Halton. And more recently, I would add Long uh, Point Basin Land Trust to this partnership as well. And we're in talks with them about uh, moving in the direction of, you know, considerations for butterfly species at risk. So all of these photos, the, the photo on the left and the photo at the top were taken in Norfolk County and the bottom right hand photos at Pinery. But what we see now happening with these partners is, um, a desire and um, funding acquisition and moving towards creating more oak savanna and tall grass prairie habitat. So putting things like wild lupin back on the landscape, which was really reduced to some small remnant populations. Nature Conservancy has done an amazing job in Norfolk County of introducing this species back onto the landscape. Similarly, we see people applying fire as a management tool and the habitat responding accordingly. So it's really done a lot to um, really restore habitat in Southern Ontario. Um, the Norris Lab has also been working on a long-term mercury sighting study focused on model duskewing. And this is um, to achieve a number of different goals. One is to fill in knowledge gaps about the species survival and its dispersal ability, its phenology, like when it comes out, when it when its peak flight time is, when it dies off. These are like pretty basic natural history things that we did not know before these projects were started. Um, they're also in the process of developing a prediction population model so we can determine things like how many model duskewing are required in order to sustain a viable population. Um, and, and those kinds of really important demographic considerations. Um, we've been doing the Mark Resighting study for um, the past four years. And we've been doing it at um, two extant populations in the Rice Lake Plains, where we had observed that what we thought are and have now confirmed are the largest populations of mono duskewing in Ontario. Um, another project that we've um, been working on is conservation genetics. So, because we were looking at reintroducing potentially populations of mono duskewing, you know, knowing current population sizes is really important, but also understanding what the genetic diversity of those populations are. So for this project, um, Nusha Kegelbody at Western University has been leading this with her master's student who just recently graduated. And um, she was taking samples of all the extant populations of model duskewing in Ontario, as well as nearby sites in the United States um, to determine one, what the diversity um, was within those populations, and also determine 
um, differentiation between populations. So are different little patches that we believe are isolated, are they interacting? They're able to tell that through the genetics work. And of course, um, understand if we have enough diversity within a population to use it as a source population to take from in order to, to create a new population somewhere else. Um, the other big component of the work we've been doing is captive rearing, and this has been led by the Cambridge Butterfly Conservatory. Um, we started the captive rearing program in 2018 using a surrogate species called the wild indigo dusky wing. That is a very closely related species that's not endangered, so we were able to play around with things like temperature and light and enclosure type and feeding regimes um, in order to kind of hone in on what we wanted to do for model dusky wing. And then as of 2019, annually, they've been taking wild caught females into captivity, um, getting them to lay eggs and then rearing out their larva in order to produce um, basically like a head starting program. So you take all the predators and threats away of the natural environment and you produce a lot more offspring than you would in a natural setting. Um, so to date, they've raised thousands and thousands of butterflies, uh, which, which initially started from 20 females in 2019. And every year we've taken, since then we've taken 30 females out of the wild. So um, uh, we always put back a ratio of 20 to one. So for every female that we take out of the wild, we always put 20 back uh, into the wild, just to make sure that we're not taking more than that population can give. And then of course, reintroduction, which has been one of the most exciting components of the work we've been doing. Um, it started in 2021 when we released 692 captively reared model dusky wings to Pinery Provincial Park. Um, the butterfly hadn't been seen there since 1992, so it was absent for almost 30 years. And this is the first ever butterfly reintroduction project that's been done in Ontario. And um, because we were having such great success at the Butterfly Conservatory rearing um, so many model dusky wing, we were able to play around a little bit with the treatments that we tried at Pinery. So in 2001, or sorry, 2021, we uh, applied three different treatments for reintroduction. One was one site where we released pupa. One was a site where we reduced, uh, released uh, adult butterflies. And then one was a site where we released um, larva. And so, there's no uh, one cut and dry recipe for butterfly reintroductions. Um, when you read the literature on what's been done in Britain uh, or other places in Europe, in the United States, some butterflies do much better in recovery when they're released as pupa. Some do better when they're released as adults. You know, you never know what life stage is, is the right one. And so that's what we're trying to figure out right now. It was really exciting in 2021 because uh, we did confirm the first year that we released butterflies that females were laying eggs on the plants in the pinery, uh, which was a really good sign. And that butterflies were generally sticking around in the areas that we had identified as suitable habitat for them. Um, so that was all very promising. We also started up a mark marking study at the pinery, similar to what we were doing at the extant population. So we could continue to monitor the population at pinery. Um, so in 2021, we were really focusing mainly on like determining the survival of the individuals that we released. Um, we wanted to start a baseline for population monitoring in terms of what we released in 2021 and also track natural dispersal within the park. So, um, you know, if we know we've released individuals here, this is ground zero and we've marked them, then we're able to track how they naturally move throughout the park on their own. So fast forward to 2022, um, this was a really exciting spring for us because um, we were basically waiting with bated breath to see like if the butterflies survived over their first winter at the release site. That's the number one time period in which reintroductions fail uh, is the winter period because so little is known about wintering ecology. Um, and there's just so many factors that can play into, you know, a tiny little insect surviving the winter. So um, it was really exciting this year when the first model dusky wing were reported at Pinery. It was actually um, reported on iNaturalist by a citizen scientist that misidentified it, but regardless, it was flagged to me by this person who was 
pardon me, responsible for vetting iNaturalist records that a model dusky wing had been seen. It was very early in the season. And um, immediately that day, I was actually already at the park. I went out looking and I saw my first model dusky wing that had naturally overwintered at the park and emerged. So that was really exciting. Um, we had a crew of six people working full time at Pinery to monitor our population there. We had great success in terms of, um, you know, we had males and females emerge. We saw individuals mating, like it's pictured here. Um, we had females again laying eggs. We had second generation butterflies flying. So all of these were really good indicators that what we were doing was working. Uh, we also did a second uh, release this year. So we again released butterflies to the park. And we anticipate that, you know, most recovery projects require about, you know, three, four, even five years sometimes of releases in order to build a self-sustaining population. So this is just our second year that we're in right now. We also decided to modify our treatments slightly. You'll remember that I talked about in 2021, how we did three different treatments, adult, pupa, and larva. What we saw in 2022 when we went back is that we had um, far more individuals emerge from our pupa and adult sites than we did from our larval treatment site. And we're still not sure just after one year if that is because there is something to do with the, the treatment of larva, like larva is not a good life stage for us to release. Maybe there was like, you know, high predation of larva at the site. Um, maybe the, the conditions weren't right for overwintering. I don't know, we don't know. We also don't know though, if it was the site that was chosen. So this year we did a bit of a rotation and we released our larva at a different location, which will allow us to understand next year if it was the site or the treatment that failed. And we think that after two years, so 2021, 2022 treatments, by 2023, we will have things very uh, kind of nailed down in terms of what treatment we, re we move forward with um, and what, what is working and what is not working. Um, other things that we've got going on here, of course, is stewardship and outreach. I try to do as many presentations as I can just to get the word out about the work that we're doing. Um, we also are working with Pine Grove Productions right now through a Species at Risk Stewardship Program grant um, to create a documentary about the work we've been doing. So that's a pretty exciting project. Um, they've been working with us this is the third year. So they've actually documented the process since planning to implementation to they were there at Pinery this year to see us, you know, and doing the monitoring of our population that overwintered. So that is coming to a wrap up now and the documentary will be out next year. We've got a website now, you can see the website there to hear about, you know, different things that we're doing. I try to keep it updated. Um, and then we have swag and apparel that we've been working on with partners at the Butterfly Conservatory and Wildlife Preservation Canada in order to do outreach. And I think this is just a really important component of the work that we do, um, because I think it's important to educate the public about the importance of this work. Um, and it's nice to see a species other than monarch receive a little bit of attention. So in terms of next steps, in 2023, we're going to be running the same monitoring program at Pinery, and we'll be doing additional releases. As I mentioned, we're doing the full-length documentary at Pine Grove with Pine Grove. We're also looking at turning our attention to Norfolk County and doing additional reintroductions at locations in Norfolk uh, in partnership with Nature Conservancy and potentially Long Point Basin Land Trust. And then I'm also working on a frosted elfin recovery feasibility assessment right now. So um, you might recall earlier in my presentation. Um, frosted elephant is one of the lupin feeding butterflies that's been extirpated from the province. And recently, um, I was awarded a contract with the Canadian Wildlife Service to look into the feasibility of reintroducing it back into Canada. So that's a really exciting project. Um, it's exciting because the government is taking notice that what we're doing with model dusky wing is working, and perhaps it could be considered for other species. Um, the other reason, you know, people often think, why is butterfly, you know, recovery important? Um, and I have always been interested and in, an advocate for using butterflies as biological indicators. That's what I did my master's research on. Butterflies are super sensitive to changes in their uh, habitat. Uh, we know, 
as example from the disappearance of three of these butterfly species that something was going drastically wrong within those habitats for all of them to disappear. Um, and so bringing them back is not only a sign that we're taking steps in the right direction to recover that ecosystem and that habitat, the sustaining of the population at those locations is an indication that it is healthy and what we're doing is working. Um, and so, you know, oak savanna habitat, although I've talked about it here in the context of butterflies, is really an extremely important habitat for a huge range of different wildlife and plant species, many of which are also at risk. You know, things like the eastern hognose snake and red-headed woodpecker. Um, you know, we go birds, herps, insects, there's like a full range of wildlife that depend on these systems. And so a lot of them are not necessarily easy to recover or easy to monitor, and but butterflies are relatively easy to recover and relatively easy to monitor. So they're a great indicator of the ecosystem. And I'm hoping that the work that we're doing will have a bit of a conservation ripple effect and that it will go on to benefit, you know, the habitat and all of the species that it supports. So just in terms of funding, I'd like to acknowledge all of the people that have contributed to this project. Um, in terms of the NSERC crossing, or uh, sorry, the NSERC Alliance grant that we have right now, um, we have all of these partners. We've also been able to support students through my tax and have received generous contributions from the Weston Foundation uh, and the Toronto Entomologist Association and Lambton Wildlife Inc. So I'd just like to acknowledge all of the organizations that have um, contributed to making this work happen. And with that, I will thank you. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that people have about the work that we're doing. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was a great presentation. Um, I, I did get one question uh, while you were chatting there uh, sure. from one of our participants uh, asking um, what uh, we as individuals can do yeah, that's a great question. And it's always nice to get that question because it means that people want to do something to help. Um, so in terms of like uh, overall butterfly species at risk, I mean, I would say just, you know, participating in the kind of the conservation movement to protect and conserve and create pollinator habitat is a great way um, to make an easy contribution in your backyard. You know, they're you know, we're talking about some specialized butterfly species that occur in these rare habitats, but there is a huge range of wild bees that are in trouble right now that need, uh, you know, our help. They need native plants, they need um, pollen and uh, nectar. So just, just creating pollinator habitat right in your backyard can really go a long way for a wide variety of um, insect fauna that you might not even be aware of. Um, I have a couple of questions as well, uh, just to give people a, a few minutes here to keep uh, typing away. Um, I'm just out of curiosity, I can't remember if, if you mentioned this, but uh, how far can uh, the dusky wing travel? So like if you bring it out to a site, like will it find other New Jersey tea pop pockets like a couple of kilometers away? Oh, sorry. Or does it, um, does it require that reintroduction at each site? That's a really good question. And until relatively recently, we didn't know the answer to that. It was always assumed, like if you go back and read the status report of the recovery strategy, <clears throat> you know, back in 2015, <clears throat> you can see that it says like the dispersal ability is unknown. We think it's like one to two kilometers max. It's a tiny little butterfly. However, through the genetic research that Western University has been doing, and some of the mark reciting um, data that we've been able to collect, it looks as though the range is actually about 10 kilometers, which was surprising to me. It doesn't mean that every butterfly will fly that far, but you know, once in a while, probably a male goes off to try and find new females and establishes, um, you know, new population somewhere else. <laughs> So it's possible then the populations could expand into new uh, habitats on their own. That's, that's Absolutely, great. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, hmm. and I mean, one of the biggest things with pinery, people often ask me like, why pinery? Why did you guys choose to go there? Um, a lot of the butterflies 
were lost from refinery initially in, in that late 80s time period because of mismanagement of the park for Oak Savannah. So there was like excessive deer browsing, fire suppression, so the canopy closed in and wild lupin and New Jersey tea were essentially absent from the park. That was confounded by a few consecutive years of drought um, and then the butterflies just disappeared. What's happened since then is mainly through the work of Alistair McKenzie, who manages the park resources now. They're, they've reintroduced regular fires into the park. There's a deer management program in partnership with the local First Nations group. And when they started putting some of those checks and balances in to the park, the lupin popped back and the New Jersey tea came back. And it was always there in the seed bank. It just wasn't being managed in a way that allowed it to persist. And so now New Jersey tea is actually one of the most abundant understory plants in the park. But because of where it was and where the extant locations were, you know, in Burlington and Race Lake Plains, that was obviously further than the dispersal capability. So they just kind of needed our help to get there. But the hope is that they will naturally disperse to other locations within Pinery and beyond Pinery where suitable habitat occurs in nearby areas. And I was also thinking just regarding like uh, the fact that we are moving species from more northern or northeastern populations to southwestern populations. Uh, and then thinking about things like climate change, um, has there ever been discussion about do we, should we augment the population with um, butterflies found, you know, just south of the border um, to move them into those more south, southwestern locations in Ontario? Or do you think that uh, the genetics and ability for the, uh, the butterfly to adapt is, is, is okay on its own with the populations we have in Ontario? Yeah, it seems like the answers to date is that these populations um, are not genetically distinct enough or far enough apart yet to, to make it so that it matters. Like if we were moving them perhaps further distances, it might. Um, but, you know, we're talking about relatively um, uh, narrow conditions that really differ between like the Rice Lake Plains and Pinery. So, so far it hasn't seemed to, to raise any red flags with any of the experts that we're working on. And something that I found amazing was that, as I mentioned, in these Eastern populations where they're extant, they have one generation of butterflies a year um, that fly, you know, from May until early July. But we knew from the historical record that there was a second generation of butterflies further south. And when we brought them down to the Butterfly Conservatory and then reintroduced them to Pinery at both those locations, we saw that given the right conditions, they will automatically revert to a second generation of butterflies. Hmm. So that was that's like really interesting. pretty exciting, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, I just got a question pop up. Uh, there, you did mention earlier in your presentation, there's a very similar uh, species that you used um, to kind of trial the rearing process of the butterfly. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but would they, is there any possibility of these species like crossbreeding? Like their habitats historically not overlap and now they might or? Yeah, no, uh, the other species was wild indigo dusky wing. And uh, there are like a, actually a, quite a few dusky wing species in Ontario um, that look to the average person very similar to the model dusky wing. I actually created a guide for the students that we work with to show like the very subtle differences between all of them. And although they like morphologically or visually look very similar, they are distinct species and they don't hybridize with each other. Cool. All right, I think that's it for questions. I'll get people on our second year if they want to ask in a, in a last minute question here, but um, some really interesting uh, facts you shared with us today. That's, that's great. Well, I really appreciate you guys having me. I'm always happy to chat yeah. about butterflies. <laughs> great conversation. Well, I think that's it for questions. So again, thank you. Uh, and a reminder, everyone, I will provide a recording of this webinar to you so you can watch it again or share it with other, other people you want to maybe have listened to it. Uh, so thank you, Jessica, and uh, have a good evening, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.